Hello, and welcome to the Surplus Boys channel. I am behind the camera today instead of in front of the camera. Today, we are talking about U.S. combat helmets. This is not going to be an extensive overview of all these helmets. It's just going to be a brief history of the U.S. combat helmet from World War I up until at least the 1980s. I don't have a PASGAT or anything past that because it just doesn't fit into what we do, as you all know. So, without further ado, we got two helmets on top of the rest of the helmets there. We'll start with those first. So, starting with this helmet here. This is a model of 1917 Brody helmet, a Tommy helmet, whatever you want to call it. These were originally issued by the British first. So these liners are very much not different from what the British would have had in World War I. Um, so we got these when we went overseas in 1917. And this is what gave us our Doughboy. And this is the helmet when you think of World War I. Um, this is an original. It's not in the greatest shape in the world. I have debated about putting a new liner in it. I kind of don't want to. It's kind of just a relic that sits on my shelf and looks pretty. So this is your World War I Tommy helmet, as we all know it. So keep that shape in mind. You're going to hear some sounds in the uh, round. That's just me putting the helmets on the ground. Now we have the 1917A1, which is realistically the first U.S. combat helmet to be developed in the U.S. So it's a 1917 shell with a different liner on the inside and canvas chin straps. And these canvas chin straps to anybody might look familiar. They look like our M1 helmet chin straps. This is what we went into World War II with and pre-World War II. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, this is what our guys had. And when we went to the Philippines, this is what they were wearing. We did not adopt, as we know, the M1 helmet until 1941. <clears throat> so, in front of you, I have four M1 helmets of varying. These three are ostensibly the same. That's the outlier, but we'll get to that in a second. So, this is what you would consider your first iteration of the M1 helmet. This is a front seam. As you can see, your front seam is right there. This lighting sucks in here, I'm sorry. But this is a front seam fixed bail helmet. So, I'll start with that. Here are your bales. This is your liner. This liner was designed off of a Riddle uh, football helmet liner. And this is what we would basically go to until Vietnam. You have this liner chin strap, which would hold the liner to the shell. Or if you were just wearing the liner by itself, you could put the chin strap up front or actually use it. And then here you have the two fixed bales that make it a fixed bale. Now, I know you're all going to say, this is the helmet for my restoration videos that I haven't finished yet. I know. I have the chin straps literally right here. They're right here. I just have to sew them on. So give me crap for it in the comments and I'll do it. So liners were made by a host of different companies. This one, I believe, is a Westinghouse. But Westinghouse made them McCord. Uh, not McCord. McCord made the shells. Uh, Westinghouse, Firestone, CPAC, but that was post-war, uh, MSA, Minor Safety Appliance, and the very, very early war ones were made by Hawley, and they were a pressed cardboard liner, and there was low-pressure liners made by hood rubbers. I don't have either of those because they're very expensive. So, that is your first iteration of the M1 helmet. Front seam, fixed bail, and now this rim on these helmets are stainless steel. Um, and paint doesn't stick well to stainless steel. We'll get to that in a minute. So, these two helmets are practically the same. This is a restoration job done by somebody. It's pretty decent. This has a Firestone liner in it. Um, these helmets would have khaki colored chin straps on them. This is a swivel bale. There's your liner. Um, like I said, this is a restoration. This one was done quite well. It's been recorked. Um, this is actually my wife's helmet for reenacting. This is my helmet. It is in a Marine Corps uh, helmet cover at the moment. Um, this one has a repo at the front liner in it, actually, and it's, it's halfway decent for what it is. Um, these would be what the chin straps would go to uh, very late in the war into Korea. They would be OD7, still a swivel bale, still a front seam. Um, and you can actually see on this helmet, I'd have to take the cover off 
but you can see on this helmet here where the actual fixed bales were broken off and these were welded back on because that was the common, that's why they went to a swivel bale on these helmets is because the fixed bales used to break off all the time. So these are your World War II helmets. This is a Vietnam helmet. Now, let me get two of these helmets out of the way here and we'll show you. If you look at, I'm actually not gonna use this helmet for that. I'll use this helmet. So if you look at this helmet and this helmet and compare it to each other, you might not be able to see it, but they changed the profile of these helmets in right after Korea into the 60s. So this shell is actually, it's a lower profile shell than the World War II M1s. Now in Korea, these were supposed to be in Korea, they went to these uh, pressure clips that held on the chin straps, the bales, and these retainers on the chin straps. Now, the reasoning for these was if a shell blast came, it would rip the chin straps off and not decapitate you or break your neck. Hence why a lot of these photos you see of GIs in combat and stuff, they don't have their chin straps on. It was a urban myth or urban legend, but it was true. It would happen. So this is the style liner they went to in Vietnam. Um, this is actually, and they, they, this is actually a paratrooper liner. I have another Vietnam helmet with the correct cover and everything on it. It's just, it's at our other filming location. So on these helmets, they upgraded the nape, nape strap in these liners. This is the nape strap in the World War II era, uh, and post-war liners. And they upgraded the webbing up top. So instead of having this circle in the middle, all the webbing attached in the middle like this. Um, and then the liners were also made out of a different material. I forget what they're made out of personally, but I think it's almost like a fiberglass. Um, this is a paratrooper helmet. It's got the AES, A yokes in it, and it also has the clip for the paratrooper style uh, chin straps, which like I said, I have a helmet that has that. This isn't that, but this is a good representation of a Vietnam helmet before um, we had covers on them. So speaking of covers, obviously you saw this one has a Marine Corps cover on it. This is a World War II Marine Corps cover. It's an at the front reproduction. Honestly, probably my favorite one, but uh, you obviously had the Vietnam era Mitchell pattern helmet covers. This is another World War II era helmet cover. This is the mosquito neck cover. And then if you're familiar with anything of the army, they had helmet nets, a couple of different sizes. This is just the one I happen to have. This is a stand in the door 1944 replica. It's probably the best one on the market. And I think it's the cheapest. Um, so, like I said, I don't have a PASGAT helmet or any M1s from the 80s, but we used these up until the PASGAT system was adopted. Uh, they did change the chin straps over to, like, the clips, the button-style, PASGAT-style chin straps. So these did get changed. Obviously, you can also see uh, other subtle differences. Is This doesn't have a spot for liner chin straps anymore. And there's no hole in the front of the liner like there is on these two World War II shells or two liners. So that's a brief overview. I say brief, it was still an eight minute long video, but that's a brief overview. I will do shorts on all these helmets if there is enough interest in that. Um, if there's enough interest in these short pattern videos of anything, I have bayonets, combat knives, a bunch of other U.S. stuff that I can go over to fill the gap in between our long pattern videos. And I know not everybody wants to watch a 40 minute video on rifles. Um, we do know that. So if this is a style video you guys like, let us know. Um, thank you for the 220 something subscribers we have. We've only been doing this for four or five months now. So thank you guys. Um, that's about it. So uh, like I said, rate, comment, subscribe, click the bell button. You know, let me know what we're doing right. Let me know what we're doing wrong. And uh, you guys have a nice day. Bye-bye.